Today I'm going to give everybody an understanding into the gravity flyer. We're going to go through what each part does, what interactions go on in it, and then what happens from those interactions. So there's going to be a lot of describing of what's going on here. So let's get into this. Let's start with what each part does. This is our gravity flyer right here. Pretty simple item to build, not too much to it. Now, what we have going on is we first start with how we start this thing up. We have these discs spinning in opposite directions. Pretty simple, we all understand that. What is it doing? It puts a resonance in all three plates. Every one of them is going to be different. The top, the middle, and the bottom. Now, the center plate here will take on everything from every part of the craft. So when you have your piezo buzzer up in the top here, it gives off one thing. The disc gives off another. This disc gives off another. This disc in itself will give off a frequency as well and the disc will also accumulate every frequency into the disc. So, pretty much pretty simple on that. The actual magnets on the bottom right here produce eddy current. The eddy current will go up and go through all three plates. The motor spinning can only spin so fast in this thing. These motors right in here are PC fan motors which means it limits the amount of spin you can get. Max 1400 RPMs on the top, max on the bottom because of the extra weight of the magnets will only get you 700 RPMs at very best. So that's pretty simple. We have an anode here, a cathode here on the bottom. Both are electrically connected to the disc basically means they're just a brush that rubs up top, on top of the disc. As they rotate, you're going to get whatever energy is transferred from those into the disc itself. That's fairly simple. Now, the rest of it, nuts and bolts. It's just a way to put it together. However, every time you put something together that's electrically connected, meaning metal, 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 non-metal, up here metal when you put something together and it has an ability to have energy go through it you'll always have to understand that energy is going to do it so that's pretty simple not too hard right that's pretty much all the electrical connections going on in this thing now let's get into the interactions when you rotate this disc like I said earlier this disc, disc takes on the frequency. This disc rotates, it takes on the frequency. We know that the center plate itself puts off a frequency. We know that the piezoelectric puts off a frequency that goes into the center plate as well. Now, one other thing that people don't realize is the magnets go through eddy current. Eddy current goes through the bottom plate, goes to the middle plate, goes to the top plate. All three are connected. Now, Let's get into a little bit more of the understanding of this. So, when you have eddy current rotating, and it goes through both plates, it gives the ability for a capacitor to work. The top plate and the bottom plate are now locked in a capacitor. That means that this and this would be your upper and bottom plate in a capacitor. The center disc would be your dielectric. Now, most times when I say dielectric, you would think of an inert material with a high K value. Not in this case. In this case, the center plate must have a charged field on it in order to amplify the capacitor. So, here's what's going on. As your resonance comes from your center plate here, from your Tesla coil, again, there's another part to this that I didn't mention earlier, sorry about that. The Tesla coil. All the frequencies in here go into your Tesla coil. The top four inches of that Tesla coil will change in frequency. It'll run through the gamut of everything that went on here in that top four inches of the Tesla coil. 
So what you'll see is you'll have frequency spikes. One, two, three, four, five, six. They'll vary in exactly how much amplitude they actually have. The biggest spike, you know, of all is the biggest amplitude. So as they transfer into there, what starts to happen? You have an electrically conductive device putting energy back into a device that puts out energy into this. What you're going to get in that Tesla coil is a state where everything backs up. You have two forms of energy hitting each other. You're going to get it to where it squeals. Normally, we would see this in a Tesla coil when you put too many amps in the number one coil. It starts to make a sound. That's what it makes. Because this is a secondary, that sound would be different. Usually, it would be a buzzing sound. Everybody talks about the fishing reel sound. Alexi always says it's in the Tesla coil. This is the reason for that sound. It has to do with the amount of energy in the craft coming back to the amount of energy in the Tesla coil. You would say, the Tesla coil is connected to the center plate. If it's giving out the energy, why would it take it back in? It's the interconnection of the fields. Because you're putting high voltage in this circuit as well, on this top plate and this bottom plate, you're going to get a different form of energy here that actually will go back into that Tesla coil and it'll start to create the energy pathway that way. So the interconnection of the fields. Let's talk about this a little bit. When this thing goes right here and you turn on your high voltage and you spin it, you're putting out a field. Now the field will only come about one millimeter away from the disc. I know Alexi says it goes over like this. It doesn't. It stays about one millimeter away from your disc. That's where the charge is. So, in order to get the interaction, this part here, right here, your little anode right here, it'll start charging on a high voltage charge. As you turn on your Tesla coil that goes to the center plate, it'll create an interaction between the two. When the interaction happens, it amplifies the amount of energy. Why is that? The amount of the energy here is expanding the field. So we generally would say, look at the center plate and how thin it is. It's growing. It's swelling in energy. So instead of being one millimeter off the plate, it continues to grow to a bigger level until it can interact with the field of the disk above. That's when you get your interaction point. Now, Alexi always talks about spark over and there's distance between the discs. What is that all about? Let's start with the spark over. The spark over doesn't happen when this anode touches this plate. The spark over is actually between this top plate and this center plate. You need to get the top plate as close to the center plate as you possibly can. Now, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you understand that the actual center plate with the energy in it is swelling. Therefore, if this plate, this plate, and this plate all become conductive, and this plate can interfere with it, you're going to get a spark over. Now, you don't want that spark over. That will kill the experiment. You have to start again. What you're trying to achieve in this is to get this field as high as humanly possible, while this field and this field do not spark to it. Because this is a capacitor, the eddy current goes from the bottom disc to the top disc, interlocking the two. Therefore, anything in here in the center plate will expand the capacitance of the center plate. Again, it goes around the whole thing except for the top. The top cannot be electrically connected to the whole frame. It has to be separate. And it has to do with the piezo buzzer and how it works inside. So, we covered the electrical connections of what's going on there. Understand it's okay to spark over here. It is not okay to spark over between the center plate and this disc at any time. Let's talk about the actual understanding of the plates themselves and the heights. So, everybody says it has to do with the atmospheric conditions on the Earth. So let's expand this a little bit. 
they say humidity changes it. Well, let's under, understand that a little bit more. The earth itself, when there's no sun out, has less energy. When the sun comes out, there's more energy. The fields of the sun push against the fields of the earth, creating more energy inside the earth. Therefore, anything that has a value that could be brought into energy like air, it'll actually change it. So, it's easier to transfer energy through the air when it's hotter outside than it is when it's colder outside. You already have an additional form of energy coming into this. So, when we look at our gravity flyer again, understanding that, now we know that we can put this plate as much as the bottom to this as we can without getting it to spark over because we have an easier time getting the amount of energy. So is it higher during the heat or lower? If it's hotter outside, the disc has to go higher. If it's colder outside, it has to go lower. That's a simple understanding. Now, the capacitor will pick up strength based on how low you can get this thing because of the amount of eddy current that goes from your bottom plate to your top plate. The more eddy current you have, the more coupled the top and bottom of the capacitor are. And the more that it squeezes on the center plate of energy. If the energy in the center plate is growing exponentially, you then are able to squeeze that and in the squeezing of it creates more energy. So let's talk about another phenomenon that goes on before we move on from this. Your Tesla coil being put into the ground. Why is it so important? This is a true understanding of how gravity works and not what you think it is. Generally, we think of gravity as the Earth's crust is a negative, the positive is up here in the atmosphere, and we have a flow that goes down. That's an incomplete version of what's going on. We have a core of the Earth, and we say it's iron. Then we say we have fields coming out from that and that those fields create a magnetosphere. Our magnetosphere is on the outside and we have different layers of that magnetosphere. What is the misunderstanding that we need to know? The spheres start at the core, yet we only pick them up when we get outside the Earth. The misunderstanding in this, or the incomplete understanding of this, is that there are spheres underneath our feet. Anytime you rotate a magnet, or anything that's magnetically charged. It will create this effect. The very closest to it is the first sphere. That will be the strongest field. Then as they build out, they go on. We understand it from the actual outside of the Earth. The true understanding is from the core itself. So what does that mean for us? We're standing between one sphere and another sphere. We have the one that we can see above us, we have the one we cannot see below us, and we're standing here on the dielectric. That's the understanding of what's going on. So, when this field is here, and this field is here, anytime that we have a dielectric in it, the dielectric will automatically try to bond itself to the bigger strength, the one that has the most strength of the field. So, what we find is, the actual energy comes down, it goes into the dielectric, the dielectric changes the charges on that and pulls it down towards the other sphere. This means that everything on the actual crust of the Earth is charged in one direction. We see that as gravity, but when it really comes down to it, we're living inside of a capacitor where there's a field that goes down in between the two. That means that we're on the dielectric portion. A lot of what goes on in this gravity flyer works the same way. We have to understand charge in something or a polarization of something, not necessarily the energy that goes into it itself. The energy is just a conduit in which the charges get into something. This is a very much needed understanding of how things work. So let's go back to the gravity flyer. Now that we understand how that works, let's look at our gravity flyer again. Again, here's the charge, 
here's the charge, here's the center plate. This right here is like the surface of the earth. It's going to expand and contract in the amount of charge it gets. That's the true understanding of what's going on here. We're dealing with the center plate mainly in this. This right here, this right here, it's a means to an end. It is not the main part of this craft. The main part of this craft is here in this center plate. Now, let's get to the true understanding of what's going on in the piezo. The piezoelectric buzzer is actually a transmitter and a receiver. So, as we put energy into it, it overwhelms the piezo buzzer and it becomes a transmitter. But when you push the button, what does it do? It turns off the transmitting part of that piezoelectric part. So now it turns into a receiver. However, because it's a transmitter and receiver, it will also transmit that same frequency. So as it takes in the frequency, it's also pushing it out. So to understand this a little bit better, we have to go through the frequencies of this center plate. As we go through it and we can map it on our oscilloscope, you get the spikes. Every single spike has a different value. As you align your piezoelectric disc to any one of those, you get an amplification. It doesn't mean it's the correct amplification of the craft. You need to find the amplification that goes the very highest in all of it. Now, here's the tricky part. When every bit of electrical part is connected, putting your oscilloscope to this device will blow up your oscilloscope. So, you have to find a way to find this actual value at the highest point and peak. Now, when you do, this is why Alexi doesn't use the oscilloscope, by the way. This is why he does it by just looking at it or understanding where the energy comes from. When you have the spike happen in here, in this center plate, it's changing the amount of energy in this. And you can physically see the change. You'll see the motors pick up in speed. You'll start to see the whole thing vibrating a little bit more. And these anodes and the cathodes will start to light up electrically a lot more. This is another reason that when I say the actual spark overs between this and this is because no matter what you do, this part right here, this anode will always spark to these plates because of the amount of energy that you put in there. It's an undeniable fact that you cannot get away from when you start testing this thing. So, what is the higher form of energy caused by? And I always say you put this thing on the ground. Why? You have to take your Tesla coil into account here. It's one of the most important parts of this whole design. The Tesla coil is connected to ground. If you do not have your Tesla coil connected to the ground, you lose 20% of your Tesla coil. Right there should be a moment where you start to understand there's more going on here than what you thought was going on. The energy comes because you're pushing back energy in here, and as the energy comes back up from the Tesla coil, it produces a higher amount. As it goes into the center plate, it's not necessarily always the connection that goes in there that produces that higher amount. It's drawing the power from the ground just like your Tesla coil does when it's connected to the ground. Therefore, it charges the center plate even faster. If you have this on a table, or if you have a gravity flyer hanging from the ceiling, you will not notice this at all. You will not notice this as it picks up charge. You'll get a slight amount of charge. What does that mean? You're going to be in a state where you have an ungrounded circuit, or you have a floating ground. It's harder to pick up in testing. When you put your Tesla coil connected to the ground, you're going to pick up this energy a lot faster and see it more times than not. The chances of hitting this without a grounded Tesla coil is 1 in 600. Trust me, I've been doing a lot of testing. It really is that low of a percentage of a chance to find this energy. This is not just a little bit of energy, it's a lot. So, 
we get back to the understanding of this thing. It's all connected. Let's get back to the piezo buzzer. When you get this plate to put off a megahertz frequency, it's going to show up in the piezo buzzer. It, the piezo buzzer, because we're putting energy into it, will have a frequency of its own based on the amount of energy that you put into it. So, the true understanding here is the center plate, when the piezo buzzer is turned off, it takes in the frequency, it then puts out the frequency, which then creates a difference in the plates. So, this part is hard for people to understand. We have charges on every part of this whether it be positively or negatively charged. We can pick it up with a static meter. We can find out this is positive, this is negative. The plate itself will show positive on one side and negative on the other. It's perfectly fine. We should all understand that that's possible. So, what is the change? When you push that button, it forces this plate and this plate to interact in a different way. We are now going to overwhelm the positive here with the charges that come from beneath. We are going to take this and flip both of these charges to go one direction. This right here on the piezo buzzer, again, you have to disconnect this from this plate in order to understand this. It has to be separate. Anytime you're dealing with charges, the charges always want to go in one direction. The small amount wants to go to the bigger amount. Then it'll create a pressure. What happens when you change this? If you put the smaller amount on the top and the bigger amount on the top, the direction wants to go up. If you take the actual smaller one, put it on the bigger part, but the bigger part has more energy in it, it'll actually work like this. As this one pushes down, the rest of this pushes up. You're going to get an imbalance there. This right here, this simple interaction, is the second lifting force in our gravity flyer. Yes, that's right. There are two lifting forces in the gravity flyer. This is the second lifting force. The interaction between all of these plates right here causes things to go in a different direction. As this pushes down, it forces this to push up. In order to do that, you had to have a primary lifting force. The primary lifting force, otherwise known as the hovering force, is what the actual Tesla coil is doing. This is one of the fundamental key features that we didn't understand until just recently. As the Tesla coil field comes in, it is not going to lift it, but it is going to allow you to break from gravity. As it does that, it creates a spot where it's a hovering force. This will keep it in the same spot that it's at. It will not make it go up and down. It's a hovering force. Now, as you take the inner flip here and get it to change and go up, you get the force in one direction. However, in anything that you do that's like this, it's short term. You push the button, you let it go. You push the button, you let it go. What's going on here to create that? It has to do with the sounds of this thing or the harmonics of it. This is something that's really going to blow your mind. Every time you put a frequency in here and you have it between two plates, you're going to get a harmonic. And every time you go through the harmonic, it gives an amplification to anything that's in a frequency in your disk. Now, harmonics play a portion because every single time you get a different frequency, you're going to get to a different harmonic level based on the amount of energy that you put into it. So, as it's all being putting energy into this, you're going to be in certain harmonics. This is aluminum. This is not steel. We must get to the harmonic of aluminum. This is one of the hardest ones to hit in this. You say, I hit the first, second, third harmonic. I hit the fourth harmonic. I hit the sixth harmonic. You can't hit the seventh. You miss the fifth. The fifth harmonic is aluminum. That's what you have to hit. Now, if you can hit that, you can understand the energy amplification of hitting 90% of the material in this craft has now become harmonic. That is one of the understandings of the picking up of energy. 
you can now amplify the harmonic in order to get your more energy. So, there's one more thing that goes on here. We have an octave level that's in our center plate. Now, to understand this better, it would be putting the singer in the right tune. As their vocal cords go, only in the correct tune can the singer break the piece of glass. If they put a, a, um, a wine glass in front of them and they want to break it, the only way to do that is to be in the correct tune. That's like the octave in this. It has to be tuned correctly. When it is, it is very resilient to change. The change, when it goes back and forth, it wants to go to a different one or another one, it'll actually stop. It goes here, it wants to go here, it comes back. It's here, it wants to go here, it comes back. And it'll always try to stay in that very spot. Now, this is why Alexi can mess with this thing and it's not changing harmonic. A lot of times in testing you'll see me tap the plate to change the harmonic or change the octave. The actual thing right here will not change it once you get it set in the right spot. The reason being is because the piezoelectric buzzer is a receiver and a transmitter. Therefore it will interlock. It will create a uh, interlocking portion that cannot be broken. A phase lock if you will. It's going to stay right in that same thing. So, what's the actual answer of go what's going on here? As we increase the energy through all these processes in this center disc, this right here creates pressure on the top and bottom. What you're getting is you're expanding the center part of this whole thing. You're taking the dielectric in between and you're expanding the energy out from it it creates the bubble around the craft as a field. That's why when you see it, it looks like it become buoyant in the air. It'll bounce, just like that. That's the understanding of this gravity flyer, guys. There's more into it with the interconnected parts of it, but the biggest part is the amount of energy going into the center plate. We have discussions on whether the actual circuits are right or not right. There's a conversion rate when you go from Europe to America. There's a whole lot of things going on here. One thing's undeniable, the amount of energy going in. You can always calculate it by the amount of distance from the craft you are and you can still get an electrical field. We take the Gravito meter and if you stand five feet away and you're still getting a signal, you should understand that the amount of energy in there is much higher than you ever thought it was. This Gravito meter works at maybe three feet to my craft right now. I am working on amplifying my Tesla coil. I built a second Tesla coil. I got it out to five feet. Still not enough energy. It is not giving the amount of energy I need to pick this thing up off the ground. Again, that hovering force is not big enough to break gravity at this point. I am still beholden to what's going on because I haven't had enough energy to put into it. All the rest of the features of the craft are working 100% just like they're supposed to. A lot of people out there say, well, in your videos you go here, 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 and here, and it's something new every time. When you're reverse engineering something, you go through phases in that. As you discover each phase of everything, you add it to the amount that you knew before. That's why it constantly changes. At this point, we're in the final leg of understanding this thing. We now know where every part is. We know what each part does. We know the interactions of each part. We understand the complexity of it. We now need to apply power in the only place you can apply power. That's in our Tesla coil. That is the only thing, the only thing in this craft that'll work. We tried it on high voltage on the disc. You guys have seen me out here with 20 kV and putting them on the disc and what it does. It doesn't do anything for anti-gravity because it's not working on the anti-gravity principle. When you put more power into this center plate, the ability to change the charge is the greatest ability ever. That right there causes every anti-gravity effect. You go, well, ion wind, what does ion one have to do with anything here? it still changes the charges between the anode and the cathode 
you're creating a charge that goes in one direction. Say static electricity, we've seen that a lot lately. Well, static electricity works on the same principle. You still have an anode and cathode in the center. You still have a charged portion. Again, we're not working on a different principle here. It's the charges that come up in everything that we want to look at. It is not the surface value of what you're looking at. You could say ion wind, you could say static electricity, you could say piezoelectricity. This thing has all three of them in there. What is the unifying mark of all of them? It changes the actual charge on the plate, whether it be positive or negative. It comes down to a simple experiment. Take a PVC pipe, take a piece of cloth, rub the pipe. You get a different charge on it. You take that charge and you put it over a piece of paper, the paper becomes charged and lifts. You take that same thing with that same charge and you put it over to a can. A can then picks up the charge and pulls it towards it. We can take high voltage and put it on a charge and then put it to the can and it'll create eddy current. But the same factor happens. You are still charging that can with a charge. It is now repulsing it because it doesn't like it. Where in the other experiment when you take the pipe and rub it, it then goes over to amplify it so it comes together. It's not hard to understand this, but most people don't see it. They come out and they say, ion wind. Ion wind is pretty much irrelevant except for the fact that it has charges. The amount in it's way too low for anything to work. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. You can take a thruster and build another thruster and another thruster upon it, and you can get a higher ion wind. The problem is, your weight will always be too high versus the amount of ion wind. That's why when you see something that looks out of the norm, it's not an ion wind because it can't work on that principle. It has to work on the principle of the charges. That's the underlying factor in the gravity flyer. We are charging something, that, like Alexi says, to repel against the earth itself. But we must have it on the earth itself to start with to build the energy of it. Then as we flip the field, it jumps. That's it. We're dealing with one charge up above and the one down below, and then we're moving in between it. That's all anti-gravity is. That's what this device is doing. It's telling us in every way possible that that's what it's doing. It's not telling us it works on any other principle. As a matter of fact, I'll bring a paper lifter over here and show you the actual understanding of this because you need to know it. This right here is the paper lifter experiment. I show this a lot on my channel and I show it when I do the gravity flyer. There's a reason for this. This is real simple. It's just a piece of paper, piece of aluminum foil glued to it. Same thing on the bottom. We have a piece of paper with aluminum foil here. And we have right here just the piece of paper. It's folded, made a hole in the center. We folded it, made it look like a UFO. What is it doing? We have this right here that gets charged as well. It's a piece of PVC. Wood would actually be a bad thing for this because wood sucks in the charge. Now, in this experiment, what I do is I take high voltage here and high voltage here, positive here, negative here. What happens? Well, so I can hold this up. Let's take that off. This right here will come up and it goes like this. What is it doing? Well, it's not working on ion wind, I can tell you that right now. It has to do with the value of the charge on this. We are taking this from a simple part of the experiment where it's a moving item in between two fields and we're making it charged. When we charge this, it then pushes against this piece here and creates a force. This force will now always be there because now Instead of this being just the dielectric, it has now become a charged part in this field. It now goes to a field that has more charges to it than the smaller one here. Therefore, we have force in one direction. And it'll always create force in one direction. You could put two of these on a, uh, just a straight board here and then let them spin all day, just like T.T. Brown did. This is the understanding that he knew that most of us don't. The charges are working and that's what he's doing. This right here, put together, is a capacitor that works in one direction. It now 
we'll take a field here, a field here, no field here, charge it in between and create this charge pushing on this charge which creates force. You can take this and put it on the scale just like this and create force in a downward direction. This is a true understanding of charges when you do this experiment. It's one of the most revealing things you'll ever do if you ever wanted to get into static electricity. Now, you could take a Wilmhurst, you could take a uh, Van der Graaff, you could take high voltage DC as long as you thin it out enough and get rid of most of the amps and it still makes this experiment work. This experiment's not working on ion wind. The value of this right here, this piece of paper, is way too high of a value in weight than ion wind can ever do to lift it. If you've ever made an ion lifter, and again you have to make one to find out, if you overdo the weight, it'll never lift. There is a ratio there, and you cannot change that ratio no matter how much you want to until you get to the charge portion. At that point, you can change the charges in anything that you want and it'll create lift. That's what this gravity flyer is working on. In all the experiments that we try to do, we try to figure this out. We're not looking at the obvious, we're looking at an overcomplicated way to see something. The obvious is the charges. The more complicated way to say it, ion, wind, eddy, current, take your pick. You know, tell me what you want. It still creates charges. In every electrical field, you're creating a charge, whether it be in no direction, when they're all equal, or you're creating a difference in between the two and creating something that's not equal. So, a gravity flyer here. Some people think you just plug it into the wall because it's just high voltage, right? No. Let's go over it one last time. And we'll go over a way to start this so you understand it. You turn on the disc all the way to full. They're only 12 volts. They're PC fans. Turn it all the way to full. It takes that to get this bottom disc to rotate at any kind of force whatsoever because of the weight of it. Now, as you do that, you back it down. I usually back mine down in between 7 and 8 volts. What does that do? It creates a rotation here. And this disc that's right here will always go faster than this disc. But this disc, because it already has centrifugal force, it'll actually stay at a higher value than it normally would. That's why you have to crank it up all the way. Now, we go to the next portion of it. We turn on our high voltage here. I turn it on, and I tap it several times. I use a dial. It'd be much easier with the button. We're trying to create a charge in one direction on each plate. Boom, boom, boom. Tap it, tap it, tap it. Create a charge, create a charge, create a charge. That's what we're doing. Then, you leave it real low. You go over to your Tesla coil, it goes into your center plate. At this point right here, before that Tesla coil is turned on, this thing is already shaking like this. Why? Because this plate, this plate, is now creating your harmonics in here, or your amplification points. It's already in there. This is already part of it right now. You're not changing any part of that. The next part that comes in is your Tesla coil. You connect your Tesla coil to here, and it adds an energy value. Now you're starting to couple your capacitor. Because of the eddy currents here and here, it's already gone through and created your uh, amplification, it's created your harmonics, it's also created your eddy current between all three, it now has your capacitor value. Now, this field has to grow. As this field grows, this thing starts to spark over no matter how low you have your high voltage, because now you're changing the amount of energy inside your field. The amount of energy inside your field goes up to both this, and it then creates a capacitance inside your capacitor that now increases the amount of the capacitor to a higher value. Now, you're looking for the spikes next. You then want your piezo buzzer to turn on. You're putting a signal into this thing as your piezo buzzer. It is a constant because it's always on. As you change and shift, your piezo buzzer itself, it creates an imbalance in your system. It changes this plate to this plate. These plate goes a different direction, you change your charge to now go up. As this pushes down, these charges now go up. This is your secondary lift force. The amount of amplification that you can put on your Tesla coil itself 
is your primary lifting source. That's what's going to keep you in a hover mode. You cannot get the lift without the hover mode. But you cannot get anything to lift higher when you just have the hover mode in here without this part right here. They're interconnected. They cannot be uncoupled in order to make this thing work. It's a two-stage process. Now, when all of that is done, depending if you can put enough energy into this, the actual ground will actually make this thing the capacitor to ground that it needs to be. It will take this plate and create the capacitor to ground itself. It is an open air capacitor to ground, but your Tesla coil is in, co in connection with the ground itself. Therefore, the amount of energy in this creates the loop that allows the center plate to pick up energy that allows everything to go forward. As you set the right octave in this with this piezo buzzer, as you push the button, it's setting the octave. It allows it to go to the fifth octave, which is where this is, needs to be. Then you can start to produce the amount of energy you want and start for a lift. You don't have to worry about anything in this sparking over as long as this plate does not spark over to this plate. As you see the interaction between your Tesla coil and your high voltage, you see the sparks over here grow. You do not want that spark to hit this center plate. That's your gravity flyer. It is a very complex capacitor. It's also one of the world's strongest capacitors. That's why it's working. That's why it's not on a known principle. Because to be honest with you, no one's really thought of it except for Alexi himself. We didn't understand all the different experiments he did to get up to it. And until you unlock that door of where he went, you'll never understand where he was going. There wasn't just the simple face value of everything he was doing. It all had to do to be one more complex feature. He says it in Russian. When you get it and translate it in English and you understand the way I understood it or just explain it to you guys, then you truly have an understanding of what he was trying to accomplish. He said it himself. Everybody, when they tell you what they're doing, it may be a little harder to understand. You have to first empty your head of all the thoughts that you got from everywhere else in order to understand exactly what they were doing. That's what we did here. We picked every little portion of this thing apart to see what each thing did individually. As we did that, we made videos of each thing individually to show how it worked. We tried to interconnect them back to what we thought was going on. It wasn't until we understood the simple fact of what was really going on with what he was doing and what he was trying to accomplish that we could understand this thing. It is simply a big capacitor with a giant field around it that lifts off with two different lifting forces, not just one. And you cannot change the material in this thing because the material itself has a value in the amount of amplification it gets. That's why I never change it. I stuck to what he did. And I started running it the way he did. With the actual motor speeds that he did. With the voltages that he did. The last thing I need to do is put the Tesla coil value to where he had it. This is truly the understanding of the gravity flyer. I really hope that you guys are starting to see and understand this. It has been a very complex road to get to this point. The next point is building the biggest Tesla coil I can that can still be handled inside this thing and just run it. I built two so far. The second one, it had more power, but still not enough. It's not letting me get to that next level. All the rest of the craft is working 100% the way it's supposed to work. It's working with the correct materials. I don't need to add anything anywhere. Not at all. It all works perfectly. It is exactly the way he designed it to work, and it is actually working that way. The last point in this is that Tesla coil. When you can start to understand why a Tesla coil can lift a lifter, you will finally be on the same page that I'm at. It's not about everything else. It's about the charges. The charges have always been key in this whole device. guys. I hope you really understand it. I hope I explained it well enough. Maybe at some point I'll have to explain some more stuff or go a little more slowly through some of the stuff. 
But these are the interactions going on here. There are a lot of them. You cannot take one out of the mix without ruining the entire experiment. If you try to over amplify one portion of this, you're going to under amplify another one and you're going to fail in the experiment again. It's just the way this thing works. You're going to have to accept it for what it is until it lifts. Then you could change anything you want to. And I won't care one bit. Because the understanding will be there of exactly how this system works. Anyway, if you like what you saw here today, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. Do all those fun things. Have yourself a great day. Thank you.